God this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we'll read the, our section and from verse, starting in verse 9 here in just a few minutes. But we've been taking some time here, and we're still talking about the spiritual gifts, right? And we need to remember when talking about the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit is the gift, right? We, are, we have the Holy Spirit living within us if we're followers of Jesus, if we're Christians, if we're following, serving Jesus, uh, the Spirit of God lives, and He's the gift. And what the Holy Spirit wants to do is empower us for ministry, as we were just talking about here just a moment ago. But not only that, I want to take a few minutes, because we've been on this, this little mini-series inside of this series of the First Corinthians, talking about these, these spirit gifts, and I want to recap where we've been over the last few weeks. And remember that the Holy Spirit's work is not just to empower us for ministry. There's more than that. We talked about this probably three or four weeks ago, that the Holy Spirit, one of the things that the Holy Spirit wants to do, and the main thing is, is to glorify Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And to, to glorify, really what that means is, is to make famous or to highlight. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do. It's to make Jesus known, to highlight Him, to make Him famous. Another thing that the Holy Spirit does is He shows us the truth of the Bible. So when we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit lives within us, and He helps us to understand it as we read it. Holy Spirit's work also is to convict us of sin. As Christians, we have the Holy Spirit, like I said, living within us, which is a common theme we'll say a lot today. But the Holy Spirit hates sin, right? There is no sin in God, and so the Holy Spirit is God, hates sin. And when we sin, the Holy Spirit gets uncomfortable, and then He makes us uncomfortable with that sin. That's what's called conviction, right? So it's a turning, we got what the Holy Spirit wants to do is to get us to turn from that sin and turn back to God. The Holy Spirit also reminds us of whose we are. If you are a Christian, if Jesus is your Savior and you love Him and you're following Him, we are sons and daughters of God. We are children of God. We belong to the family of God. And so what we need a lot of times in our lives, because we can forget, is we need to be reminded that we are a part of the family of God. We are part of something great. And we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Another thing the Holy Spirit does is He empowers us to overcome sin in our lives. And so what we need to do is we need to surrender to the, our will, to the will of God, so that His Spirit can live through us and work through us in our lives. And the Holy Spirit can live through our lives, and what He does is He helps us to overcome the sin that's in our lives. And like we've seen, the Holy Spirit also empowers us for ministry. That's what we've been talking about the last few weeks. And this is, you know, we're using the power of the Spirit to, to minister. And these spiritual gifts that are given so that we can all have a part in the body of Christ, right? The church. We are the church and we all have a part. We're part of that. And so when we look at using or not using our spiritual gifts, those who don't use their spiritual gifts are people who are, and I'm going to say it bluntly this morning, I'm not here to really attack you, but to just make you aware is, is that when you are not using your spiritual gifts, you're really an immature follower of Jesus and you don't know how the Holy Spirit really wants to work with you. And that's not, you know, maybe you just, you haven't learned that yet, and you still need to grow in that. And then there's others who are selfish and lazy. They're like, well, I know what the Holy Spirit's asking me to do, but I just don't want to do that. I want to just do my own thing and make my own deal and, and go for that. And sometimes we either just don't feel like doing it and we're lazy, or we just want to do our own thing and not follow what the Holy Spirit's leading. And so when that happens, it hurts the church. Now remember that the spiritual gifts are God-given abilities distributed by the Holy Spirit to every single Christian as God sees fit, and they are used for the common good of the church and the world. That's what these are for, spiritual gifts. All, every single one of the spiritual gifts are important to the church, and we need every single one of them in operation so that we can effectively be the church that God has called us to be. We need all of these. 
And so let me just remind you of the gifts that we've already t- took in, taken a look at. We're just going to go through these really quickly this morning just so that we, we, we remember them, and then we're going to get into a few more this morning. So the very first spirit gift we looked at, looking at 1 Corinthians here in 12 and, and even Romans 12 and Ephesians, was words of wisdom. And that's supernatural insight into people and situations. Like God gives you uh, some insight into what's going on in somebody's life or this situation. And then we talked about words of knowledge. And that's supernatural insight into the Bible. We talked about how the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to us what this, the word means, but this is even more insight into the Bible. Then there's teaching and preaching. And this is the ability to communicate clearly the Bible and the gospel message, that what Jesus did, his life, death, and resurrection, what, the, what it means. Then there was evangelism, and that's a strong desire to invite people who don't know Jesus as their Savior to come and know him as their Savior. And it means a messenger of good news or the gospel. And so we are all called to share the gospel, right? That's what Jesus left us with. We're all called to share and tell people about him, but there is a, there is a spiritual gift that is upon us where the Holy Spirit wants to power us to really evangelized, powerfully evangelized. And so there's also leadership is another one. It enables a person to see the bigger picture and motivate and equip others to accomplish tasks to the best of their abilities to reach their goals or to accomplish the vision. Then we have administration, the spiritual gift of administration, and that enables a person to coordinate and organize the given plans that leaders have, and then they bring about those plans and resources and people so that ministry may be accomplished and goals may be met. You have a spiritual gift of shepherding. And this enables a person to guide, correct, and encourage others into spiritual maturity in Christ. The shepherd willingly enters into long-term relationships to see people grow spiritually. And that can be the pastor and that can be other people too. It doesn't have to be the pastor. Just somebody, you, you get alongside somebody and you're, you're, gonna, you're hanging with them and the Spirit helps you grow, help them grow and mature. We have the spiritual gift of serving. And this is the Holy Spirit working that gives you the capacity to take the initiative to meet the practical needs of people freeing them up to do what they're called to do. And so you serve them. Then we saw encouragement, and this is the one who encourages others, and it's usually behind the scenes encouragement. Like you come alongside people and you say, you can do it. This is what God's called you to do. I, I know if he's called you, you, he is faithful, he is with you, he has not left you, and you're just encouraging them as much as they need it to get where they need to be. Spiritual gift of giving. And this is someone who, give, who just gives sacrificially to to the work of the ministry with joy and with generosity. And we're all called to give as God's people, right? Followers of Jesus. This is that spiritual gift to give above and beyond. And then we saw mercy. This is the gift to connect with people. You're, you're filled with compassion toward people. It gives you, uh, you know, you just, you just notice when somebody's hurting and you have compassion for those people. And so when they hurt, you hurt. Spiritual gift of hospitality. You love to open your house and make people feel welcome, but it's, it's, and it's more than just entertaining people. It's actually making them feel like they belong and they're welcome. And so those are the spiritual gifts that we've looked at so far as we've gone through uh, this mini-series inside of this greater series of 1 Corinthians. And then what we saw last week is, is that you can be using your God-given, spiritually empowered by the Holy Spirit giftings and misuse them. And the reason that we can misuse our gifts is because we are not using them with love. And the gifts that we're going to be looking at next, if these are misused, they almost always divide. They almost always split up churches. And these spiritual gifts that we're going to be looking at are the ones that some people get scared about, not sure about. It can make people uncomfortable And that's why we need to talk about them and we need to understand why they're given and what they're given for. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. We're going to read down through verse 11 here this morning. And it says in verse 9, To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, 
to another the ability to distinguish between the spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. And so in looking at the spiritual gifts, I want, I want us to be different than the church at Corinth. Right? We've noticed that the church in Corinth was a mess, and they didn't use their spiritual gifts with love toward each other. They didn't know how to deal with those that had maybe different spiritual gifts than them at that certain times. And, uh, and so they were jealous of others, or they were pride and full of pride against others. And so they were using them in a wrong way. And when churches divide over the issue like things like this, it's mostly because of immaturity. And so as we look at these gifts today, and we're going to look at some today, and we're going to look at the rest of them next week, um, we're going to need to allow the Bible to speak to us so that we can see what it says about these certain things. Now, the gifts that we're going to be looking at here, there's two different views on these. And the first view you're going to see up on the, on the screen, I'll get to that in just a second. But when it comes to these, these what I'll call sign gifts, there's two different views in the church today and, and why it just is. And so these are the gifts that we're going to be looking at, things like speaking in tongues, prophecy, miracles, healing. And so those that are in the cessationism group say that these spiritual gifts stopped. Like they ceased being practiced on early in church history. And to just simply just describe what this really is, is they would say that God did all of these things in the first century and before that to spread the gospel message and to authenticate the church, and then God just really stopped doing those things at that point. And, and they point out in church history the lack of the miraculous and the reason, that's the reasons why these gifts had stopped. Now the other group is, is going to be on the other side of this, and there are continuationism, and this is the view that all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit have continued on through until now. And what God did in the Bible is what God still does today. And some people think that God should do miracles and that there should be uh, tongues and prophecy and they should happen every single day. There's also some, you know, and they say they should happen at work and they should happen at home. They should happen um, wherever you go, right? Those things should happen everywhere, at church, all those places. Some of those inside this group say that it should happen only when you gather at church, and some say it should just happen sporadically, very rare, and it'll only happen on occasions. If you're wondering what we think, we think that these gifts still believe, are today. This is what we believe. These gifts are still in operation today, and they should happen everywhere we go. God may use us wherever we are. In fact, in Psalm chapter 135 and verse 5, it says, For I know that the Lord is great, and that the Lord is above all gods, and whatever the Lord pleases, He does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. And so when we look at, at this verse up here, I believe you can't say that God doesn't do miracles, right? Why? Because God does whatever He pleases, wherever He pleases, whenever He pleases. He's a God who is all-powerful. He's a God who's all-knowing. He's a God who's everywhere always. And so I believe that God is still in the business of doing miracles. That's who He is. On the other side of that, I believe that God doesn't always have to do miracles either. All the time. He does them, but it doesn't have to be all the time. It may be, it may not be. And so as we look at the spiritual gifts, let's allow the Bible to speak to us and lead us this morning as, as what they are and to how they are used. And so we're going to look at four of these ones in these verses today that we read, and then we're going to look at the last two next week, and we'll wrap up these spiritual gifts. And what I want you to begin to do is pray and say, God, where are you leading me to be involved in ministry? Because next week we're going to give you some opportunities and say these are some things that we could use and help in ministry at Chico First Assembly and say maybe I fit in here, maybe I fit in there. Um, and some of those things we'll give some trainings with and, and all of those things. But we want to see as many people, if not all of us, involved in some sort of ministry empowered by the Spirit here at Chico First Assembly. So get ready for that. It's happening next week, okay? And so the first one we're going to look at today is the spiritual gift of faith. And this is the divine ability to envision what needs to be done 
and then trust God to accomplish it even though it seems impossible to other people. All right? Now, there's a story of a guy who fell off a cliff, and he was like plunging to his death down the side of this cliff. And about 75 feet down, he grabbed onto this small bush branch that was hanging out the side of the cliff, and he grabbed it, and he stopped himself. And he adjusted his grip, and he's hanging on to this little branch off the side of this cliff, and he begins to cry out, Help! Somebody, please help me! He's yelling this, and soon he hears a voice, and his voice says, I'm here, and I'm ready to help you. And the frantic man holding on to that little branch says, Great, help me, but who are you? And the voice answered to him. He says, I am God, and I'm ready to help you. And the amazed man cried out, Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Help me. And the voice replied, Now, have faith in me, trust me, let loose of that branch, and I will save you. And the man looked down, and it was about a thousand feet down still, and he thought for a minute, and he said, is there anybody else up there? Faith isn't popular with most of our world, especially in the Western world. Our secular world says faith is superstition, The rationalist says faith is the antithesis or the opposite of reason. And Paul said, though, that faith is one of the ways that the Holy Spirit empowers us in our lives. Now, every one of us as followers of Jesus has to have faith and use it. It's impossible to become a Christian without faith. We need faith really to just walk the Christian life in our every day. Now, while all Christians are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ and what he did, the Bible also says that there's this gift of faith which the Holy Spirit supplies for the good of the church. And we need this. And so with this gift, certain members of the body of Christ, of the church, can see the invisible, they can believe the incredible, and they can receive the impossible. And too often what we tend to do is we tend to run the church much like we would a business. But a church cannot be run like a business. We have to depend upon faith. We have to trust God. And God blesses us when we depend upon Him. And so this spiritual gift of faith is beyond this any kind of normal kind of faith. It's this faith that, that you have when other people have given up and they're, they're done and you pray really big things and you dream the big things. They believe that these things can happen because God is involved. And when God is involved, nothing is impossible. And they help all the other people around them walk their Christian walk in that faith. They say, trust God. In fact, last week when we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, In verse 2, it talks about this mountain-moving faith, and it says, if I have faith so as to remove mountains, now does that mean I can have faith and move the Sierra Nevadas a little closer to us here so I can have a better view of them? You know, we've lived in the mountains a lot of our lives in Alaska and Montana, and we were kind of mountain people for a long time. I want to have them closer. Is that what this means? No, it's not what this means. But it's faith for the impossible to be the possible, to to be possible. And so when the Holy Spirit empowers you with faith like this, it just means you're steady, right? Like things may happen all around you and you don't just go real low when bad stuff happens and you don't get real, real, real high and you're not on this roller coaster in your life. You just stay steady. Yes, you rejoice and yes, sometimes you're sad, but you're steady. It doesn't really affect you so badly. This is what happens. And so you don't freak out when things aren't working well like they should. You have a level head. You know that God can still work in this situation that you're going through. Even when it all seems like nothing can happen, it looks like that in the normal eyes and the natural eyes, but you have faith to know that God is with you and He can turn it all for good. This is what this is. And so how do you know when the Holy Spirit is working through you like this? Well, do other people say or think that maybe you're just a little bit off? Do you brag about only what God can do? Do you ask, or do do people ask you to pray for for really hard things? Do you hate the word can't? 
That's how the Holy Spirit's going to work through you, empower you with faith. The next one we're going to be looking at this morning is the gift of healing. And this is the ability to pray with people that results in supernatural healing. And I think that there are some people, if not more than some, that have trouble with this spiritual gift because sometimes it can get abused. And especially we see it a lot of times on Christian TV. Not all of it, but some of it, right? And we've heard things like, if you just give money to my ministry, then God will give you, he'll, he'll give you health, and he'll give you, if you give to my ministry, he'll give you all the things that you ever wanted, you know, riches and fun toys. And if you do that, then you'll get all of these things. And when you hear things like that, it, it just doesn't make you think so well of, of spiritual healing. It makes you skeptical. Well, verse 9 we saw, Oops, I guess I'm not there. Verse 9 tells us that it's the gifts, plural, of healing. It's not just the gift of healing, it's the gifts, plural, of healing. And this can mean that the Holy Spirit wants to use this in a variety of different ways and different people to minister in the gift of healing at different times, right? Like, he may have somebody here who's going to pray and see somebody heal, and then somebody over here another time, or at different places and at the same time, Right? And God will do that at his pleasure. It may also indicate that there are various gifts to heal various kinds of sicknesses and diseases, like that God wants to heal the whole person. I've seen people healed through prayer. I've seen myself (laughs) healed in prayer. My brother, his family, his daughter was miraculously healed. Through prayer, God, they, people were praying for her and she was healed to the point where doctors said, this is impossible. There's no way this could have happened. We, and they wouldn't say, go as far as say, God did some miracle here. God healed her. They just couldn't believe. Like, she was this way. There was no way that it was ever going to change. But now she's changed. God healed her. And they just couldn't, the doctors just couldn't wrap their minds around this, uh, how this had happened. And they gave glory to God all the way. And I've also seen great godly people who have been prayed for and never been healed. And when that happens, it makes spiritual healing hard for us to understand because there's, there's, there's this, this mystery around it, supernatural healing. We like wonder why. Why this person, not this person, right? And when we get unsure about things, we tend to, to push away from those things because we just don't understand it and it makes us uncomfortable. We don't want to deal with it or think about it. And what happens, though, when somebody gets healed miraculously around you and near you, somebody that you know, well, some people rejoice and praise God. Like, oh, yes, praise God, this person was healed. And then some people get real uncomfortable and they just don't know what to do with that. And there are things we can do when we don't understand what's going on around us in the church. One thing you can do is you can leave the church. Another thing you can do is you can find some people who are also that way and you can gossip and make fun of and tear down people that's happening when this happens. Or you can do the third thing and you can find a leader in the church, you can open up the Bible and you can discuss it. And if you're wondering what I think is the best option about that, I can tell you it's that last one there. You find a leader, you open up the Bible and you discuss it, right? And so Matthew chapter 4 Verse 24 says, speaking of Jesus, so his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, it says, and he called to him his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. And so the disciples were given the same ministry and the same authority that Jesus had. It was to preach, it was to teach, and it was to heal. And then you get into the book of Acts, right? And this is the story of this new church after Jesus has lived his life, died on the cross, resurrected, and now has ascended back into heaven. And every chapter in the book of Acts, except for chapter 17, has some sort of supernatural event happening. Every chapter, except for 17, right? And so what is this gift of healing, and, and how does it work? Well, in James chapter 5, it tells us, if anyone is sick, or is anyone among you sick? 
Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And so some people come into church and they're not feeling well. They're sick or they've got something else going on in their lives. They're hurting and they need prayer. And that's why I like to offer some time, you know, where you're welcome to come up to the altars and we'll pray for you. So there's an opportunity for you to have that after service when we're finishing up our service. That's why we have in this little wooden box here bottles of oil so we can anoint you with oil if need be and pray for you. And if you're wondering what in that entails, if that's new to you, right, that's like we have these little bottle of oils. All we do is put a little bit on our finger, put you on our forehead and pray for you. We're not going to dump you and douse you in oil and you're going to walk out of here drenched in oil today. No, that's not what this is, right? But we want to be obedient to the Word of God. Although maybe if the Holy Spirit says, well, we will dunk you. No, <laughs> most likely not. <laughs> but God wants to work in your life. He does. And all of our sicknesses and hurts, they're not just physical. We have emotional and mental, and we have sometimes sin hurts in our lives that God wants to bring healing to in our lives. He wants to heal all of us. And so let me just give you some words of caution about healing. Some people may tell you that if you just have enough faith, then God will heal you because He wants to heal everybody. And if you're not healed, it's because you didn't have enough faith was a lack of faith in your life. Now, faith does play a part in healing, but it's just because you weren't healed doesn't mean that you didn't have enough faith, okay? That's not how this goes. And this is why so many people have a hard time with supernatural healing. They've heard some things like this. And some would say that, like, if you go to the doctor, then that's a lack of faith and God won't heal you. But you think about it, the guy who wrote the book of Acts with all of those recordings of the supernatural God working, supernatural works through the, the church and the leaders of the church. It was written by a guy who was a doctor. Doctors definitely play a part in our healing. And when God, you know, and so we can go to doctors. I say, trust God and pray first and then go, or pray as you're going to the doctor, whatever, you know, but pray and trust God ultimately in all of that. But when God randomly heals, or it seems random to us, and He heals different people, it, it makes this hard sometimes for us, hard to grasp and understand. Like, why did this person get healed over here, but not this person over here? What happened here? And when it hits close to home, it makes it even harder for us. Like, why did this person get healed, but not this person, like my father or whoever it was? What's going on here? And it's easier for some people to say, well, God just doesn't heal, so you don't have to try to figure that out. You know, see what God's doing. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to wrestle with the character of God. Another question to think about this morning, if it's, is it God's will for us to be sick? Is it? Maybe in some cases it is. I, you know, I don't know. Remember Paul? <laughs> He's the one that wrote 1 Corinthians he had what he called a thorn in his side. We don't know exactly what that is. People have been trying to figure that out for centuries, right? But this thorn in his side, whatever it was, this is what he called it. It was something that kept him humble. And he didn't receive a, a healing from it. He even prayed three times and asked God to heal him of this thorn in his side, whatever it was. And God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. But this isn't always the case. God still heals today. Healings are for God's glory. Healings are to bring people to know Jesus as their Savior, either directly by being there when it happens or hearing the stories about it. And we may not understand why some people get healed and some people don't, but all I know is, is God knows best. And I do know that we will be healed completely, maybe not in this lifetime, but in our next and we will stand in the presence of God and we'll have no more sickness, no more crying, no more pain. So God knows what's best. And I know that that's easy to say like right now while I'm standing up here, but it's hard to deal with when it's one of our loved ones. So how do you know if the Holy Spirit's empowering you to heal? Do you care about those that are hurting and are sick? Do you feel drawn to them? Has God healed people that you've prayed for in the past? So God may lead you to pray for somebody and you, they, they may be healed. He may lead you to somebody who's sick and, and, and just to, you know, say, pray. And you pray and you see them healed. 
And so if you're sick, pray to God for healing. If you're sick, ask the leaders of the church to pray for you. Go to the doctor. But ultimately, with all of that, trust God with your life, that He knows what is best. Then the next one this morning that we're going to be looking at here is the spiritual gift of miracles. And this is the ability to call upon God to do supernatural things so that He reveals His power. It really means a working of power. A miracle is is an event beyond the power of known physical or human limits, right? Something that just no way could have happened. And Jesus obviously had this in his life. We saw it. You see it as you read his, the story of Jesus. So he walked on water. He turned water to wine. He raised Lazarus from the dead. He fed more than 5,000 people with five small loaves of bread and two small fish. And these were miracles. They were, these are not the only ones, but these are just some that I'm highlighting this morning. And it's important to note the context of miracles in the Bible. Some of the ways, a lot of times when you see them. Many of the miracles that we've heard about happen when God was about to do something big or was doing something big. And they usually occur when God wants to get our attention. Like God had to establish in Pharaoh's eyes and Israel's eyes that Moses was called by him to speak and lead. And the result of that was miracles. In another age when religion was almost dead and people had almost walked away from uh, the religion of Judaism and, and, and all that, that God had given, God was working miracles through the prophets Elisha and Elijah. At Bethlehem and through the ministry of Jesus, God was saying to the world, hey, here I am, I am alive. After Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, he ascended to heaven and the apostles did all these great works through the Holy Spirit. And it was as if God was saying, hey, I'm still alive and I'm still with you. I didn't abandon you. In Paul's ministry to the Gentile world, which is anybody who's not a Jew, right? They didn't know anything about God and Jesus. And he was doing miracles as God was saying, hey world, my name is Jesus and I died for you. Like, well, here I am. And so why is it that we don't hear about miracles as much anymore today? Like, wouldn't our friends and family and co-workers and neighbors, wouldn't they love to see a miracle? And when they'd see that, like, oh, now I know that God must be real because this thing happened. But as Christians, we walk by faith and not by sight. And when Jesus did miracles, all of a sudden, all these crowds started following him, right? But all of they wanted from Jesus was more miracles. They didn't really want Jesus And so Jesus rebuked the crowds for this. And instead of saying, maybe I've got it wrong here, I should pursue Jesus, they ended up just leaving. All they wanted was miracles. And I think today a lot of people would love to have all these miracles in their lives, but I don't know if they really want God. And I'm not saying that miracles don't happen today because they do. I believe that. But with miracles, people really just want God to serve them and they don't want to serve God. And so we'd love to see more miracles, but we've got to remember two things. First is, miracles don't guarantee faith. Pharaoh never believed, even though he saw all those miracles. Second, miracles appeal to the eyes rather than to the will. And so the twelve, like, would they really have been closer to the eyes, you know, with all that they saw? And so miracles happen when God wants them to happen. When God wants to say, here I am. So he can reveal himself to us. Show us how powerful and how great he is. And so miracles definitely do happen. The last one that we're going to be looking at today is the spiritual gift of discernment. And this is the ability to know things that can't be figured out by the five senses in our lives. It's the ability to read between the lines and to get to the truth of an issue that's happening. And so when the Holy Spirit works through you this way, It's your your gut just tells you things aren't right. Now this is given so that you can help people, not so that you can get you don't get swindled in the next car you buy. Okay, maybe God will work that way, but more it's more about you know helping people. And so God gives discernment so that we can help people get to where they need to be. It's to help them grow in their faith and their knowledge of Jesus. And so it's to it's lead toward maturity in Christ. 
And it talks about discerning the spirits. And this could mean ideas, influences, feelings, writings, or inspirations. When you think about it, Satan is an artist at disguises, right? For every good thing that God has and God provides for us, Satan has the opposite of that or something that goes against it. He produces a counterfeit, something that looks good, but it's not. You think about that, right? Where there's Christ, there's the Antichrist. Where there's prophets, there's false prophets. Where there's the gospel, there are false gospels. And so this spirit empowerment is this uncanny ability to detect the ring of reality. What is truth? You can spot a phony. You can smell a rat, right? You can sift the wheat. And when God gives you discernment about a situation, it's 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 humbling thing because you now have a choice. What are you going to do with this? Are you going to help people out with it or are you going to keep it to yourself? And it's scary sometimes when God speaks to you, especially if you're new to this, and, and you don't know what to do. You're like, you have the choice. Am I going to help people out or am I going to keep it to myself? Now, God doesn't want us to sin, right? He wants us to walk in close connection with Him and when we sin, it hinders our lives. And it also doesn't just hinder our lives, it hinders the lives around us. Even if people don't know we've sinned, it still hinders the lives of people around us. And so sometimes God's way of, of getting our attention is He sends people our way to help us and turn from that sin and return to God. Sometimes He does that, sometimes He doesn't. But God has, has given us the Bible and He's given us these things that are, that are right and things that are sin. And he doesn't do that just so that we can not have any fun in life and keep us all bored and, and unpleased with anything. No, the reason that God does that is, is so that we can be protected. Like his way brings protection. It brings what's right. And so as we look at these supernatural gifts that we see here this morning, and all of the ones that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks that we highlighted real quickly here this morning, we have to understand that every single one of these has to be marked by love. By love. I believe that's why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13, right? The whole point there he's saying, everything's got to be marked by love. It's why it's in the middle of all of these things he's talking about with spirit gifts. And he says in there, if you have the faith to move mountains, if you can speak with tongues of men and angels, if you have gifts of prophecy, but you do not have love, he says you are nothing. And so in using these spiritual gifts, we need to grow and mature in our Christian walk. We need to grow in our faith in who Jesus is and draw near to him. And so how do we mature? It's not necessarily by having the power of the Spirit moving us in these gifts that we're talking about. It's a different thing that the Spirit wants to do, and it's the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, gentleness, and self-control. This is how we mature as the Holy Spirit brings these things in our lives. And just because I can get up here and preach a, preach a sermon and it connects with you and, and, and you feel like God's moving through that doesn't necessarily mean I'm mature. Just because God has given you a word of discernment about somebody in their life doesn't necessarily mean you're mature. The things we've got to ask ourselves is, am I kind to others? When people bug me, what do I do? Do I have patience? with people and with situations. When I'm alone, what do I do? Am I faithful? You see, those are the things that lead to maturity. And so when we look at these spiritual gifts, we see that God is bigger than we ever could imagine Him to be. Right? He's greater than we ever could even just think about Him being. And ultimately, aren't you glad that He is? Really, what that's what makes God spectacular is he's greater and bigger than we ever could imagine him to be. And he wouldn't be much of a God if he wasn't. And God also wants you to see how, how big his love is for you and he is. And that he's more personal than maybe you ever thought he was. That he wants to, to really have you know him like he completely knows you. That he, he's there for you. He loves you. 
He loves you more than you can even imagine. And with all of these gifts that we see, and even including the ones that we're talking about today and we'll talk about next week, God simply wants to use those through our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit to reveal Himself, to show the world who He is so that we can know Him and follow Him. And so, as the Holy Spirit empowers you, step out and trust Him. Draw near to God. Grow in the fruit of the Spirit and trust Him as He uses us to minister to each other, to our community, and to the world. Would you bow your heads this morning? So as we wrap up this morning, I really would begin to like, you know, I would just like for you to all to, all of us, me included, just to begin to ask God, God, where do I fit in? How are you empowering me to ministry? How can I come alongside and help people grow and know you? How can I bring your glory to those around me, God, to show and make you famous, God? pray that you would just say, ask God this morning that God, I, help me to trust you more in my life to know that you want to use me. You definitely want to use me, God. And show me how you want to. And so as our musicians play, would you just begin to ask God to, to powerfully lead you and work in your life And then because we've talked about healing this morning, if there's anyone who needs healing this morning, you're welcome to come and we would love to pray for you. We'll see what God does because God is our healer. So let's spend some moment and just be, you belong, you're a part, and so how can you be a part? What is God leading you to? Would you pray for that this morning?